Jake mentioned just a few moments ago. And I want to be especially prayerful today for Sister Peggy Simpson, feeling very poorly last night. Uh, back at home, though. I want to be mindful of Mitra Scaife, her family, who lost her stepdad on Friday evening late. So be mindful of that family as well. Let me encourage you to be back with us tonight at 5 as we continue our study in Romans. We're in Romans chapter 4 this evening. As you can see from the title there, we're talking today about Jesus. Everybody has an opinion about Jesus. Nobody doesn't like Jesus. Everybody loves Jesus. You find it interesting that so many people seem to dislike church, and yet they love Jesus. So many people have struggles with what they refer to as the God of the Old Testament, and yet they love Jesus. And Jesus, if you look for his mission, if there's anything comes second place to his mission of the grace that brought us salvation, I think you would say it in the terms that he came to show us the Father. He came to show us who God is. And when you think about why it is that folks don't like the church and don't like the God of the Old Testament, I think the easy answers for that is that folks don't like the God of the Old Testament because they try to put today's sensibilities and today's advancements into a, uh, into a culture that happened 3,000, 4,000, 5,000 years ago, and it simply doesn't work. When you try to figure out why it is that people don't like the church, the simple answer is that we, human beings, we haven't done church too well at times. See, the problem's not Jesus. The Bible teaches us that no one has seen God. No one has ever seen God. The only God who is at the Father's side has made him known. Now, if you notice the grammar of that, it's sort of interesting. No one has ever seen God. And yet he immediately says, the only God. Now, if you're not, if you, you can try to read that as, no one has ever seen God, the only God. God is the only God. But that makes the next phrase not make any sense at all. Who is, at the, who is at the Father's side has made him known. You see, the point is, the phrase, the only God, is in reference to Jesus. No one has ever seen God. The only God who is at the Father's side has made him known. That's not a surprise to us to, to try to articulate that Jesus is God. I find it interesting, sometimes in our prayers, we try to make no distinction we try to speak in our prayers uh, and make no distinction for God. Yet Jesus made distinctions. And I think we are good to follow his lead of the distinctions that he makes. Paul lays it out for us. That we pray to the Father in the name of the Son. And we don't pray to the Father in his own name. We pray to the Father in the name of the Son because it is the Son that gives us access to the Father. And that's the very claim that he makes. And if that's the way Jesus sees it, then I think I'm okay to see it that way as well. In 1 John chapter 4, verse 12 makes the statement again, No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us, and His love is perfected in us. No one's ever seen God, but He says, But if we love one another, He's with us. No one has ever seen God. Now that's the way John describes it. Paul takes on a little different tone, if you will. Uh, go with me to Colossians chapter 1. Paul talks about the fullness of God. In Colossians chapter 1, beginning in verse 15, makes this statement. 
He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rules, rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Again, we have Jesus as part of creation. Jesus was in the beginning. The word God in Genesis chapter 1 and Genesis chapter 2 is a plural word. And that's why he says, let us make man in our own image. Yes, Jesus was from the beginning, and yes, Jesus is God, and Jesus was a part of creation. The Holy Spirit, according to Genesis chapter 1, is a part of creation. Now, of Jesus, verse 18, he goes on to say, he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might be preeminent. For in him... All the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. In Him, in Jesus, all the fullness of God dwelt. In chapter 2, he puts a little different take on it. I, I like the little uh, slight addition that he adds in verse 9, Colossians chapter 2. For in Him, the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. Right there, in Him, in His body. The fullness of God dwells. John chapter 1 verse 10 made the statement, He was in the world and He made the world and the world did not know Him. How difficult that must have been. The fullness of God. Back in Hebrews chapter 1, the visual image of God. That's who Jesus is. He's the visual image of God. Long ago, at many times, in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. God spoke to a lot of people, through a lot of people, and a few animals, if you will, along the way. But here's the intent. Verse Two, but in these last days he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. Again, we have a nod to his part in creation. And then he makes two claims. Verse 3. He is the radiance of the glory of God. He's the very shine, if you will. He is the radiance of the glory of God. That's who Jesus is. And he says he is the exact imprint of his nature. The exact imprint of his nature. And then he goes on and says, And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Continuing on in verse 4. Having become much superior to the angels, as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. The visual image of God. You see, God always planned. God's plan from the very beginning of time was that his final, his main, his eternal covenant with his people be presented by his Son. It was determined before anything else even happened in the world much. It was always God's plan that His final covenant come through His Son because He is the radiance of the glory of God. He is the exact imprint of His nature. I usually, when I preach, I'm usually not trying to say five things, although it might seem like that. Maybe I say five things to illustrate one, but I'm usually trying to say one thing. And sometimes I want to draw it down so simple that if you're wondering at the end, then you weren't listening. If there's one thing that I want you to hear today, it is this. That what you see in Jesus matters more than anything else you see. Who you see Jesus to be 
matters more than anything else you see. Because to see Jesus for who He really is will make a significant difference in your world. If you don't see Jesus for what He is, then you'll follow somebody's, maybe your own, idea of who Jesus is, and you'll miss the point, and you'll miss the glory, and you'll miss the radiance of God Himself. Paul saw Him well. Paul gets right down to the point. This great resurrection chapter, we know 1 Corinthians 15 as the resurrection chapter. Paul's and, and the Bible's greatest discourse on the resurrection. Beginning in verse 12, Paul writes, Now if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then even Christ has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is vain and your faith is in vain. You love the simplicity of Paul. I was like, folks, you can't argue that there's no resurrection because if there's no resurrection, then the only conclusion you can draw is that Jesus wasn't resurrected. And folks, if Jesus wasn't resurrected, then what are you doing here? I find it amazing the amount of people these days who don't believe in the resurrection of Jesus. They actually don't believe in the deity of Jesus. You say, yeah, but that's the world. No, no, no. What goes for Christianity in this nation of ours? There are major parts of major denominations in our country that do not believe that Jesus was resurrected from the dead. There are people, many people, even in this town, worshiping this morning, who do not truly believe that Jesus was resurrected from the dead. Let me suggest something to you. If Paul himself could come and speak to those churches this morning, you know what Paul would say? Paul would say this right here. He would say, folks, if Jesus was not resurrected, then what are you doing here? And the answer that these churches and these people will give is that, but Jesus was a good moral teacher, and Jesus did a lot of good, and we need to be forces for good in our communities and in our world. And the church is about being good and saving the environment. The church is about being doing good things and saving the world. And the Apostle Paul would say, If Jesus isn't resurrected, then nothing else matters. Verse 19, if in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied, Paul says. But then he turns in verse 20, but in fact Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. He said, you see, the point is, Jesus was resurrected from the dead. And that's what makes him who he is. That's what proves him to be able to do what he says he will do. That's why when you pray to him, you know that it matters because he controls the world and he controls death, and death could not contain him. And so when I have struggles, I know that he will listen. And he has the power to do something about it. You might be a part of a few organizations whose benefit is to clean this world up a little bit. But you don't come to church for that. You come to church to bow your knee before the God of the world in the person even of Jesus Christ. We're all familiar with that famous C.S. Lewis quote out of Mere Christianity. But the words are powerful. And he speaks to much of the religious world of our day and many of churches, as I suggest, that are even convening this morning. Lewis says, I'm trying to prevent anyone from saying that really foolish thing that people say about him, referring to Jesus. 
What a really foolish thing he says people say about him is this, I am ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I do not accept his claim to be God. That is one thing he goes on to say we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things that Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level of a man who says he's a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell itself. You must make your choice, he goes on. Either this man was and is the Son of God, or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up as a fool, you can spit at him and kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God, but let's not come with any compromising nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He's not left that open to us. He did not intend to. Truthful words, powerfully spoken. You see, Jesus is not simply showing us how to live. He's showing us the Father. He's not showing us how to live. He's showing us God. Very familiar passage of John chapter 14. The words we're familiar with where Jesus came to his disciples. He said, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and I will take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also, and you know the way where I am going. Thomas interrupts at this point and he says, Lord, we do not know where you're going and how can we know the way? And it's to Thomas that he answers that great statement, tremendous statement, one of the greatest statements Jesus ever made. He says, I am the way and the truth and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. And he continues on answering, Thomas, if you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. They still didn't get it. Philip then says in verse 8, Lord, show us the Father, and it's enough for us. You can feel the disappointment in Jesus' voice as he answers Philip in verse 9. Have I been so long a time with you, and still you do not know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me? And the words I say to you, I do not speak of my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me and does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or else believe me on account of the works themselves. And this is after a lot of time with them. It should not surprise us when we take the moment for deep reflection that we often see Jesus a lot smaller than he is. We see Jesus as someone very much like ourselves. And what we know of Jesus, he has that ability to make us feel like he knows us well and we know him well, and that's okay. But he's much bigger than that. Solomon, as he dedicated the temple in 1 Kings chapter 8, makes a grand statement. David wanted to build the temple, as we recall. David was not allowed to build the temple. Solomon was allowed to build the temple. David get, did get the privilege of gathering most of the materials for the temple. But you have to realize something about temple. You know, today in our environment, in our culture, we think of, when we think of temple, we think of church. But did you, have you ever noticed that the great temples of the world are not large gathering places? When, actually, when you actually get into the temple, they're not large. I've had the opportunity to see one of the great ones in the world. It's Angkor Wat in Cambodia. They claim it's the eighth wonder of the world, and if there was ever a way to designate it, it probably would be termed as the eighth wonder of the world. In the days in which it was built, the carvings in the stone are just absolutely amazing, and they are just extraordinarily massive and large. You get to Angkor Wat and you see this temple in the distance. 
this building in the distance. And you realize you just walk through a gate and you're in a big grass courtyard that is many, many acres. And there's a fence that goes all the way around it that's got a serpentine uh, a snake on top of it with all of its scales carved the entire perimeter of this thing. And you walk and you walk and you walk to get to the entrance of what you think is the temple. And when you walk into that entrance of the temple, you realize you're in another large several acres and there's another fence around it. And there's another pathway leading to the temple. And when you get to that pathway and you walk into the temple there, you realize you're in yet a smaller box with a fence around it and a lot of grass and still a few acres. And you walk in another one and it happens again. And you walk through another one and it happens again. And you f you're finally figuring out by this time what you thought was this building is a grouping of walls that are just getting taller and smaller. And you finally walked into the one to where you see the actual temple itself and you realize the building is not that terribly large. And then you see its steps. And its steps are about 10, 12 inches deep and about two and a half inches tall. It's all you can do to walk the steps. And once you get up there, you kind of want to stay because you're not sure you can get down without falling. But then you get up there and you walked into the temple only to realize you're now in a stone courtyard and the temple itself is still another walk. And when you finally make it up into the spire of that temple and you realize I have finally made it to the center, to the focal point, to the temple itself and you realize only 50 people could even get in there if they tried. Because you see, what you realize is, you come to realize about temple, is temple is not about people coming. Temple is about, is this place worthy of my God to dwell here? Is this place worthy for God to stay here? We think we understand God, yet we do not understand God. We see God, yet we do not see God. We imagine God only to realize that we cannot comprehend Him. Even Solomon, proud of himself, I'm sure, after he had built this wonderful temple, got a little glimpse of what it really was. You see, the temple that Solomon built was quite massive quite ornate, extraordinarily expensive, and so much so that people came from all over the world. Countries around came just to pay a little homage and to uh, show a little praise for this great temple he had built. But yet Solomon understood in his wisdom that his God was too big for this. The words out of verse 27 out of 1 Kings chapter 8, he says, But will God indeed dwell on the earth? Behold heaven, and the highest heaven cannot contain you. How much less this house which I have built. Maybe the things I think about him should change. Oh, I think they should. Maybe the things I ask of him should change. And I think maybe they would if we were truly impressed with just who our Lord Jesus is. Sometimes the best way we could spend our time, at least for a few moments, and that's what we've tried to do today, to spend our time so that we can strive, even for just a moment, to clearly see who He is. To get a glimpse of how big and how powerful and yet be reminded that He loves us. 
and that he will dwell within us if we love one another. And even with a glance, may we walk away a changed people, reminded we don't serve a good teacher, though he was a good teacher. We don't serve a man who taught us to serve, though he did teach us to serve. We bow our heads and we bow our hearts and we bow our knees to the Son of God who is the radiance of the glory of God, the very imprint of his nature. And that's the one who gave his life for us. May we be changed. May we be forever changed. As we offer this song of encouragement, as we offer this invitation, if there are things that you'd like to lay before your church family this morning, lay before your God, whatever those needs might be, we'd ask you to come as we stand and as we sing.